people of reddit when is one time you have felt genuine 100 percent fear when i was woken up by my dogs going nuts and found out my house was on fire by the time i had woken up the stairs were engulfed in flames i truly lost all sense of what to do thought it was all over eventually got to a window and ended up throwing my dogs out the window all were okay and jumping out the window i never would wish that feeling on anybody your dogs and you make a great team running out of gas in my boat with my girlfriend in open water during a storm ended up on a shoal trying to hold the boat while a friend brought us more fuel honestly thought the waves would wash us away and drown driving to alaska on the alcan came around a turn and standing in the road was a mother brown bear and two cubs i was in a 1980 ford courier pickup with the exterior body thickness of an aluminum can i came to a quick halt as she faced the vehicle in a clearly protective stance and sure if backing up would set her off I put it in R and sat on moving for what felt like an eternity until the cubs ambled into the woods and she followed. When I was trying to sleep at around 3 and felt someone press on my bed, then bag on the chair started shaking, then again I felt something on my bed. Finally I had the courage to switch on light and found a giant rat on my bed. My so was in kind of a slump emotionally for a bit. And while I was at work he texted me and seemed pretty down. I asked him what was up. He didn't respond. I tried calling but he denied my calls. Then suddenly he just wrote I don't feel too good mentally. And just went offline on all platforms at once and shut off his phone. I just slammed my work laptop shut and ran as fast as I could to the subway to get home. When I finally reached the apartment he wasn't even there. I was so freaked out. I was just screaming his name like mad woman. Somehow hoping he'd respond. Everything turned out just fine in the end and he apologized for scaring me. But oh man. I was so sure I was gonna be the one to find his body that day. The time I got into bed with my girlfriend and immediately started coughing up blood. Ran into the bathroom and held onto the sink for dear life. Every breath I tried to take I just ended up wheezing more blood out of my lungs. By the time the ambulance got there I had pretty much come to terms that this was how I died. Then it slowed down and finally stopped by the time I got to the air. Long story short it turned out to be Hodgkin's lymphoma. Had chemo for 6 months and am cured now with minimal repercussions. Scariest time of my life. I was on a 360 degree roller coaster and you go around and around but it got stuck at the very top and the ride shut down for 5 minutes so I was upside down and I was very little and it was terrifying. This happened to my brother and grandparents. I was too small to go on the ride. I love roller coasters, but those kind still freak me out. Once my mother called me on the phone telling me that a copy of our house keys was stolen that afternoon from the lobby and someone might be in the house. This happened in the exact moment I was entering the house. Pretty scary but no one was there thank god. That is some horror film level timing. I was 6 years old and went to take a leak. I was at my grandma's house in a small village in India. The bathroom was an outhouse. Just as I was about to start, I noticed a cobra hissing at me. I ran like heck. Now that is something to be terrified of. I am sure there are no hospitals near a small village. Received a call from my dad. Voice faint and weak. A few final words telling me to take care of my mother and sister. Then I woke up. Heart rate through the roof. Some initial stages of hyperventilation. Tears rolling down my eyes. And a huge surge of panic and fear. It took me some seconds to realize it was a dream. But it took over a week to get over what I felt. It's good to know I'm not alone. Because this happened multiple times to me already. I am really glad all your loved ones are safe and healthy. I've had similar dreams and they've terrified me to no end. My first mandatory recall for a hurricane. I was recalled for Matthew and it terrified me given how dangerous the hurricane was. For those not familiar with mandatory recall it is an order to first responders, military, and essential services, gas, electricity, personnel to stay and not evacuate until told otherwise and to continue doing your job. Really bad turbulence at high altitude and a lady yelled through the plane's intercom something I couldn't understand and then kept repeating brace, brace, brace. She kept doing so for a long while, and that plane shook in ways I didn't think possible. I and everyone awake at that moment, about crap our pants. To this day, 
I cannot experience turbulence without, at least, a minor degree of fear. A couple of very turbulent flights turned me into a horrible flyer. It sucks to be the person crying at turbulence. I was in labor with my son and my blood pressure kept bottoming out. First I lost my vision. It came back. Then I lost my hearing. While I was unable to hear, all of the medical staff in the room suddenly had very concerned looks on their faces and rushed to the monitor tracking my baby's heartbeat. I then started to pass out and as I was losing consciousness I saw a nurse thrust an injection into my leg but I felt nothing because of the epidural. All of that combined was probably the scariest moments of my life. Both my son and I were okay and he's a healthy one year old now. My wife had a mini stroke at 23 while we were hiking in Colorado. I carried her part way down a mountain with pure adrenaline and we raced to a hospital. I thought I was going to lose her because we were way out in the sticks but they wound up sending her right home and saying she was fine. Somehow hearing knocking through my sound cancelling headphones. It wasn't coming from my headset it was coming from my front door and no one was there so I just went back to playing. Heard it again I decided to watch the door for the rest of the day. I'm still confused to this day on how there was a load enough sound to go through the headset. Not sure if I was just crazy or whatever else it could have been. When I was around 14 years old, my friends and I were at a mall and the mall went on lockdown because of an active shooter. Turns out it was just a guy shooting the air but at the time we didn't know that. Everyone assumed the worst case scenario. It was really scary because for the first time in my life it felt like there was a huge possibility I was going to die. This makes it sound like it's somehow normal to just be firing into the air. I once injured a dude's eye by throwing a really sharp broken piece of wood which came off a table. I didn't think it would actually hit as I was so far away. I get him to first aid room or whatever that is called in a primary school. The nurse said he had a high chance of going blind. I don't know what happens later or how is he doing now. My memories from that event are completely gone. I was very scared and so guilty. I'm very sorry, Jack. This didn't happen in EU America. When I was 10 and my mother had a nervous breakdown, she spent the entire night hitting and kicking me while making me tell her I hated her. She's take a break to cry in the bathroom, ordered my sibling and I pizza, but the breaks that night were short before it was back to the abuse. Honestly that was one of the worst nights of my life and even after years of therapy I still have nightmares over that. It was seeing her expression change so rapidly they got me and how quickly she snapped. I'm so sorry you experienced that. To have that weird mix of positive, ordering you pizza, in the middle must have been so confusing. I hope you're doing okay now. I remember watching something on YouTube and all of a sudden I had a weird blind spot in my eye. I have a fear of going blind as my eyesight is really bad. It's minus 7.5 and getting worse. I instantly started panicking, thinking that I am going blind and ran to my mother, who took me to the doctors. Turns out I had a eye retinal migraine. I had never heard of a eye migraine before this, but still, I went into instant panic mode. I get those and with additional numbness in my face and hands. Scary crap. It's hard to remember, but there was one point in the past where I was utterly terrified of my mother. I was in my room and terrified that she'd come in. Pure fair. Bro why, you good, cause that don't just come out of nowhere. When my wife almost died during childbirth. Scariest day of my life. Couldn't enjoy the feeling of having my first child because I was too worried about losing my wife and being a single father. A 9 years old on a roller coaster kinda tall but skinny. The belts and locks are in place. Went smoothly until the last bend before stopping. The safety lock went loose a notch. Almost got jostled out of seat to a 8 meter fall onto metal scaffolds and stuff. Saved by my mother's reflex pulling me back. The mom arm. Stronger than steel. When I went to get the stretcher out of the back of the ambulance when on scene at a cardiac arrest to realize I left it at the hospital. Felt like my heart fell out of my ass. I've never been more scared in my life. Last winter I was in the back seat of a truck with my friends. I was in the middle seat and like an idiot I didn't use the seat belt. We were driving on the highway and over a bridge. We hit ice. All of a sudden we're skidding to the edge of the lane. 
and I see the two foot tall cement wall on the edge getting closer and we're about to slam into it. And I knew we'd of course break it and go over. And I knew I was going to die. In 0.2 seconds I thought this is how I'll die. I wonder if it'll hurt. If I'll die instantly. If I'll bleed out. If my friends will die around me I knew I was going to die. And then we bounced off the wall. Spun. Hit it again. Spun. And hit it a third time before stopping. The entire thing. From hitting the ice to stopping, took like half a second, but I knew I was going to die. Everyone was okay, surprisingly minimal damage to the truck too. I was on a roller coaster, my belt didn't close and the train began moving so I screamed for him to stop. It was 100% fear. I had something similar happen to me my long hair was caught in the mechanism and we were about to shoot upwards. Think of like a power tower. Screaming to stop the ride. All I could imagine was it snapping my neck if it shot up. The guy did. And I actually had to get cut out. Never again will I wear my hair down to an amusement park. The night I thought my abusive ex-boyfriend was going to kill me. He had been drinking and screaming in my face demanding I tell him where his gun was. I hid it before he got home knowing he was intoxicated. Thankfully, the upstairs neighbors heard him screaming and throwing me around and called the cops who showed up before anything serious could happen. That time when a guy stalked me, I was walking to my brother's house, headphones on, so at first I didn't notice him. He followed me for several minutes, then grabbed my shoulder and started yelling at me like a dang possessed. He was yelling that I was a W. That people like me should die and things like that. I was pretty sure he was gonna beat me up, but after that looked like hours of yelling he released me. I ran like I have never ran before, straight to my brother's house, crying all the way. I was working out with a personal trainer, small gym, just for this kind of thing, and we were the only two in there. I finished a pretty rough circuit and he went to the restroom while I recovered. Then I started to feel a tightness in my chest and pain. I started clutching at my chest, thinking no no not now, not like this. I teased too soon, and then I let out the biggest, most powerful burp I've ever had, and immediately felt fine. I'd seen in sitcoms and such where a guy thinks he's having a heart attack and then gets diagnosed with gas, but now I fully understand it. I had a burp like that once. Then when I released it, it took longer than a minute and then I had another panic moment cause I couldn't inhale. I managed to whine help me at my wife before the burp kept going. When it finished, I basically collapsed, gasping for air, and my wife asking me if I just exorcise a demon or some crap lol. When they told me that my then 3 year old son has meningitis and was probably not going to get better, just for the record due to some awesome UK doctors he made a full recovery and walked out of the hospital 4 days later. I've had quite a few run-ins with work-related incidents. From rigging failing with a dozen tons of steel overhead to being crushed by a machine with overridden safety interlocks. The ones that really spook me are rotating masses though. Lathe crashes are just a matter of getting away from the chuck as fast as humanly possible and trying everything to stop the awful booming sounds. Well, if that wasn't enough, I picked up a job doing centrifuge repairs. After the better part of a year I got tasked with rebuilding a horizontal centrifuge. Imagine a 55 gallon drum made of 1 inches thick steel spinning at 3500 rpm plus. And after rebuild I start it up and it reaches full speed. Then hook breaks loose. There are solid carbide tiles inside this machine and they all broke off in the span of 2 seconds. The machine started shaking like mad and while I wanted to shut it off. I had to run behind the currently runaway machine that could rip itself apart to do so. That moment had me crouching and terrified as I made my way to the disconnect. I was bullied really badly for all of 5th and 6th grade, and the teacher was even part of the bullying. My depression drove me to do things I never thought I would have done, and I was glad my parents didn't allow me to carry a crafting knife in my pencil case. But it also caused my grades to slip terribly. The teacher would constantly tell me how everything was my fault, insult me, and he'd always say middle school would be like this but 10 times worse. I'd always been scared. The day I graduated I broke down. Everyone was crying a bit because they were sad to leave friends, and they thought I was crying for the same reason. 
perhaps just more dramatically as I was about to move to another city, but I wasn't, it was the greatest fear I'd ever experienced, because I literally thought I would die in middle school. I hope you're okay now. The first time I heard a gunshot after surviving being shot in the face with a 9mm, it was over a year later. I heard the shot while talking to my BF and I immediately just stopped talking turned around and bolted for his car. I got inside and started hyperventilating crying. It took me quite a while to actually stop breathing so heavy, but he talked me through it and calmed me down. True fear, followed by intense embarrassment. When my son started choking, he was about 9 months old and was eating his standard wheat cereal with milk for breakfast and was happily munching away. Then all of a sudden he just stopped. He went silent. Totally silent. There was nowhere moving. It was freaking terrifying. Luckily I've had children's first aid training and that and mum instinct kicked in. Slapped him, hard, on the back with his head pointing to the floor with him over my knee. Multiple slaps. Clog of cereal dislodged and he was able to breathe again. We both collapsed on the floor in tears, had cuddles and generally recovered. Then he wanted to carry on eating his breakfast. He's a trooper. When I woke up to check on my 2 month old, since she had missed her 1am feeding, and found her with a 102 degree fever. I experienced a heart attack with the age of 21. I thought I'd die during the experience. The pressure and pain in the chest, the numbness of my arms. I puked and everything went dark. Figures I managed to get my heart infected. Everything swole up and I had water in my heart valves, not native excuse me if that's wrong. That's what caused it. I was 100% sure I was done shortly before I went out. I also was alone in Chiang Mai, Northern Thailand, preparing for a multiple day jungle trek. I went to my BNB after getting dinner and a guy pulled me into a small side street and showed me a knife and started to talk in Thai. As I started to unbuckle my backpack some young guys came into the street and chased the sucker off. They apparently saw what happened. I bought them drinks afterwards. David and friend I am still grateful if you ever read this. That's the second time I nearly got robbed while traveling but I was alone that time so it was more terrifying. Hiding in a dark mothball closet under the stairs, my mom whispering in my ear, if he finds us here, he'll kill us, he was my raging stalking stepdad, being shot at by drunk crazy rednecks, being home alone and hearing the window in the next room slide up, and then confronting this wannabe burglar, and mice, nearly everyone I see one, eee have also been shot at by crazy rednecks, would not recommend. I think I felt that a couple of times so far, here's one of those occasions. When I was about 10 years old, on a normal school day, during the last hour our teacher gets called outside the classroom by our principal. I remember seeing how worried the principal was. After a couple of minutes the teacher came back, calmed us down and told us very calmly there is a bomb outside the front door of the school there was a silent panic that swept across the classroom as she proceeded to tell us to hide under our desks. We waited about an hour after the army and bomb defuser team showed up. Then one by one the families came and picked up their children. I had to walk home alone. Lost control of my car when I was going 80 on the highway. Some guy tried to rapidly merge in between me and the semi truck in front of me. And I had to make a quick adjustment to keep from hitting him. My car started rapidly swerving as I tried to regain control. At some point I realized I was going to crash and there wasn't much I could do. The one thought going through my head was don't hit the semi truck. Don't hit the semi truck over and over again. I couldn't stop the crash, but I managed to force my car to swerve into the concrete barrier parallel parking style. No damage to the car, no one else involved. I was unhurt. I consider myself to be very lucky. I was on a commercial flight and the pilot came over the tannoy to tell us luck wasn't on our side today and there was an emergency with the flaps and landing gear not working correctly, and that we would have to fly around to burn off the fuel. There would be lots of emergency vechiles to meet us when we did land, but not to worry too much as he'd recently done this emergency in the simulator. The passengers were crying and panicking. No one felt reassured. I genuinely thought we were all going to die. Comma don't worry too much. I've practiced this recently. I can only imagine how calm nonchalant the pilot sounds whilst announcing this. I was trapped in a house with a drunk friend. 
and two men who clearly wanted to frick us and were trying their best to make me drink from a probably spiked glass. I was sober that night and could think straight so I refused anything they were trying to give to me, and they looked extremely agitated at my refusal but I was adamant on not taking any substances. It took me 2 hours to get out of there. When I forced my way out, they looked at me with the creepiest stare and said you go, your friend stays. I can never forget how terrified I was. I later found out from my friend that they had tried their best to touch her and violate her whilst I was trying to figure out how to get us out. I was away from her for 2 minutes. She had gone to the toilet. My 2 year old son having a seizure. He went to bed fine. Woke up in the middle of the night very hot. We took his temp. 102.3. No way. That must be wrong. Check it again. 102.6. Suddenly. His eyes rolled back and he started shaking. We rushed him to the bathtub. No idea what to do. Panic. Tears. Overreaction time. Call to 911. Rush to the air. Not my best dad moment but genuine. 100% fear. When I woke up one morning on a cold night and seen Shaquille O'Neal sized handprints on my window, it instantly put a wave of fear and anxiety over me. Five years ago I had to tell my kids, 12, 9, their mother died. Any day now I might have to tell them I'm probably going to die of pancreatic cancer. Getting biasy results today. The first time I got on a commercial flight, I bought life insurance before that, was 5 up until the plane was in the air. I truly believed I was going to die and was holding back tears the entire flight. Didn't even get up to go pee. I waited until we landed. Probably when someone at high school made a joke directly to me about a kink that I had. As if something like a kink became well known my social life would be dead and over. I was hanging out at night in my fort with my friends in the South Jersey swamp as a young teen. Suddenly the swamp went silent. It never goes silent. At night it's loud and only the things in your immediate vicinity shush as you pass. This was complete silence as far as we could hear. In the same instant, we looked at each other and just panicked. We all were filled with a sense of absolute terror. No words were spoken. We all just bolted back to the neighborhood as fast as we could. We never knew what happened. We never felt stupid about it either. We all know something was off. But to this day, over 40 years later, I've never felt fear or panic like that. And have never heard nature go silent again either. Hey man. I'm from Central Jersey and my brother and I used to play in the woods behind our house. If there's one thing that's freaking terrifying as a child teen it's knowing that the woods are never silent unless something is wrong. When did your feeling about something is very wrong here? Turned out to be true. This happened in 2010. We have this annual water festival thing and our family and family friend bought tickets for a stand for the whole event, which lasted for like 3 days or sth. It was on the side of the street among many similar stands and we splash water on the people walking along the streets from above. I don't remember but I think it was the last day when the family friend suddenly had to cancel. We decided not to go altogether. The stand was bombed that day. So many died. We could have too. I got a good one. A few years back during my junior year of high school I was sitting at home playing this war of mine on my iPad when I had just a horrible feeling of doom in my stomach. Like the type you get when you know you got caught doing something bad but you hadn't been confronted yet. I sat there for an hour with that anxiety in my stomach. I figured I was just stressing about missing school the past few days because I had the flu pretty bad. My brother comes in the room screaming there's someone trying to get in. Now my mother is asleep but she was taking medication and was hard to wake up. We also lived in a very safe area seriously violent crimes happened maybe once every few years. Nonetheless I made sure I had a baseball bat beside me when I walked over to the door. It's dark outside but the guy comes in fast and isn't talking. Now I'm ready to swing until I realize it's my uncle on my mother's side. He says quickly where is my mom, and I said she was upstairs sleeping he my uncle looks at my brother and says get your mom downstairs please. Now my uncle is one of the most laid back and relaxed people I have ever met. I knew something was bad. 
He sits me down and he puts his hand on my shoulder and tells me my cousin who I grew up with and spent my entire childhood with hung himself. It all clicked and I freaked the heck out and ran outside and went to my friend's house who lived down the street and started banging on her door at 12 o'clock on a school night and as soon as she opened it I just started sobbing uncontrollably. So we just went inside and she held me while I cried before my dad came and grabbed me to take me home to his house a few miles away. Hardest weekend of my life. Bit frick me man that feeling I had before my uncle came to break the news. I've never felt something like it since. I don't know how spiritual I am but I'm convinced my sixth sense was going haywire because one of my best friends just died. One day I was sitting around the house and my dad told me he was heading over to the neighbors about half a mile up the road. His best friend since childhood. He was going to help with some stuff over there like clearing snow, cutting up a deer from the fall etc. He was gone for an hour or so and came back to grab his carving knives that he'd forgotten. He was standing in the kitchen sharpening them real quick when an ambulance went flying past our house easily close to 80 mph plus. I instantly felt off. Our road has maybe a dozen houses past ours. No matter who it was it was someone we knew. Dad made the offhanded remark. Well at least it's not us. He was just about to leave when the phone rang. It was his friend's wife. He dropped dead of a massive heart attack shortly after my dad had left. I'm sure my dad's comment haunts him even today several years later. Because it was just the beginning. Only three days later at Christmas we discovered his mother had been having small strokes for months and the doctors hadn't caught it. She was gone before spring. More than that, entire branches of his family tree started falling off. 13 deaths in the family in 11 months. We stopped putting away our funeral attire and instead just had it hanging on the wall in the kitchen. It was a rough year. Ouch. As someone who had a 5 death year, I feel for you and I'm so sorry to hear your family experience so much grief and loss in such a condensed time frame. I hope you're all well and if anything this has brought you closer. Warm feels from an internet stranger. Just saw nobody had actually replied to you, and thought you should know there's someone out there thinking of you. Not creepy or crimmy or anything, but I'll never forget it. Christmas 2002. I was home from my freshman year of college. The vibe in the house had been really strange and tense since I got back. On Christmas morning, my mom gives my dad a really heartfelt, personalized present. My dad gives my mom an expensive but generic looking bracelet with some diamonds in it. She starts openly weeping. Something was not right. He told us he was leaving the next day and moved out immediately, into the house of the co-worker he had been sleeping with. It was not a good time. To answer the multiple questions, we're all 5x5. Five five. My mom spent a long time very depressed and not sure what to do with her life. I was angry for a long time. My younger siblings were angrier for longer. Mom is doing great on her own now and dad is happily married to said co-worker. Way happier than he ever was with my mom. Still some lasting bad feelings, but they're all pretty good. Got home from work and was parked at my gate which was broken at the time. Saw three guys walking down the road and had an odd feeling but brushed it off and was waiting for them to go pay my car so I could open up the gate. I didn't want my dogs running out and causing a scene with the guys. They were on the opposite side of the road from me and when they had finally got to the point my car was parked I hopped out to unlock the padlock on the gate. As I put the key in I saw one of the guys running across the road. My mind immediately jumped to the conclusion that he was coming to ask for money. South Africa. It's quite common to have beggars. Until I saw he had a knife in his hand. They ended up hijacking me. Took my wallet. Phone and brand new gaming laptop. I took all my bank cards and licenses out my wallet before giving it to them and the car was recovered by my dad about 30 minutes later so it wasn't all bad I guess. My brother and dad lived in a different state, and my brother was in the hospital recovering from an accident. My first weird feeling was when I was booking the flight to see him and I was considering cancellation insurance. What if something happens to my dad and I have to fly out sooner I shrugged it off. My dad was doing fine. Two weeks later, my brother tells me that my dad was visiting and went home early because he had evidently caught something and wasn't feeling well. I got a really bad feeling and called him. It went to voicemail he did say he was going to bed early and it was about bedtime for him. 
I said I heard he wasn't feeling well and wanted to check in, and that I really really loved him. I felt weird, but my dad would have been royally p if I called 911 to his house because he was under the weather and decided to sleep it off. I decided to wait until the morning. Morning comes. Nothing. My brother sent his friend over. No answer. Friend goes in the house. My dad had passed away. I wish I had called. It just didn't seem that serious and I have a penchant for overreacting. The last thing he told my brother was, I'll be fine. I'm just going to bed. The thing that got me was the voicemail. I looked through his messages. Mine was red. If nothing else, I know he listened to that voicemail. One of the last things he heard was me telling him I loved him. My dad passed from a heart attack, according to the coroner. It didn't sound like anyone could have helped even if they had found him right after it happened. The coroner said, it seemed sudden and not like he suffered at all. And if nothing had happened yet, he probably would have sent them away anyway because of his I'll be fine attitude. I am grateful for a couple things. 1. Both of his parents passed before I was old enough to remember them, and he spoke openly about all of it, as well as his own mortality. I think that helped me tremendously in dealing with the same. 2. He was always sentimental. I knew that him hearing me say, I really really love you, bye, meant something to him. I knew he felt the same way because he used to send me random messages about how happy he was to be a dad and how much he loved his kids. From this experience and a couple others, I've learned to speak up when I feel something is off. I may be wrong, and I have been plenty of times, but nothing is wrong with calmly speaking my mind or taking precautions when concerned. Bad things can and do happen. It doesn't mean they will. And it doesn't mean I have to overreact when I don't know what's going on. But also, sometimes crap just happens. Make sure the people you love and care about know you love and care about them. I distinctly remember waking up one morning and preparing for the drive for work, feeling a little odd. Now, my drive to work at the time took exactly 7 minutes. Not a lot of time to think about anything. Not a lot of time to do much but maybe pop off a single cigarette on the way in. Three minutes into that drive, my stomach suddenly got that awful feeling. That something is very, very wrong feeling. Usually that's about when I'm due to get written up for something. So at the time as concerning as it was, I was trying to laugh it off, or at least push it to the back of my mind. But when I got to work, everyone was oddly quiet, really often solemn. It didn't take but a couple minutes to find out that one of the supervisors that a lot of people really loved who was personable with both employees and guests, had committed suicide that morning. I trust my gut. I was talking on the phone with my husband while he, his dad, his dad's girlfriend, and their two dogs were returning from a road trip to see husband's grandpa who had just suffered a stroke. Suddenly, the phone cut out. Rather than thinking it was to bad service, I had this rotten feeling in my gut. They were supposed to be home in about an hour, so I went to meet them hoping it would calm my anxiety. It didn't. An hour went by and I couldn't get through to my husband. I drive to my mom's house. I open my phone and scroll to the news app I never used. The front page was that a car had been hit by a truck. One man was dead. The other was in critical condition. And the woman was fine. No mention of the dogs. So I hoped I was wrong. My mom turned on the news while trying to drum up conversation and the news was covering the situation. Now, it had been about an hour and a half since I spoke to my husband. I started to panic because the news description was so close. My mom began calling hospitals, and soon found a man with my husband's last name. We didn't know if it was his dad or him who had died. We rushed to the hospital and were greeted by the chaplain who began explaining that it was my husband who was in the hospital and that he was crushed in the accident. The flight for life paramedics had to induce a coma because he was so alert. He was in surgery for some rithing like 18 hours, and we were told his chances of making it was slim. But after the surgery was declared a success, my husband remained in a coma for two more days before finally waking up. He's got titanium in both femurs, his hand was detached from his wrist, and his skull was split completely down the middle. Those are only his worst injuries. He had several other broken or fractured bones and a lot of internal bleeding. One of the dogs had gone through the window and died in the ditch nearby. The other saved my husband's life. She was laying in his lap and absorbed part of the impact, protecting his heart. 
The girlfriend turned out to only want money, and my husband's mother is a nightmare. He was left with so little of his family. Luckily, he has since recovered for the most part, and is quite successful in his field. A few years back I was coming home from uni and decided to go to the store for some food. While walking towards the store I got the feeling that I shouldn't go there and there's probably some food at home. So I turned around and walked home. The store is about 3 minutes from my house and about 2 hours later the roof of the store collapsed and 54 people died. Personal 1. I was home alone and my cousin called me at 11pm and I was tired to pick up and thought about calling him tomorrow. I went to lay in bed after couple of seconds I had a weird feeling about the call I didn't answer and I called him back just he to tell me my grandmother passed away and that I should tell my parents and my aunt, his mother, book two flights for my parents immediately to get there for the funeral. I asked my dad to drive me to a friend's house for a gathering, he refused. It was kinda weird he refused, and I normally would have kicked up a bit of a fuss since it's a long and awkward train journey, but I calmly accepted that he wouldn't be driving me, and I went and got the train. There was an air show happening that day, an aeroplane engine failed mid-performance and crashed onto the motorway, a lot of people were killed, people going to the same gathering as me were killed, I would have been on that same strip of road at the same time it happened. I'm so thankful my dad didn't drive me that day. I was 18 and got in my first place with a couple of roommates. First roommate decided in December to move out and shortly after I met a girl and we were starting to stay over at each other's houses. We got paid on a Tuesday with tip out, which if you have never worked in restaurants is a percentage of tips to the waitresses that goes to the kitchen staff. I don't remember how much we got but it was a good week coming off the new year. Roommate had made plans to go out after work and I was gonna stay home. We got in my car. I took him to the liquor store, dropped off another co-worker and then we went home. He left about 20 minutes later. I decided to play some xbox and chill on the couch. I then was going to roll a joint and that's when it hit me. It was a feeling I'll never forget, because it felt like the description they give to the Dementors from Harry Potter. It was like the oxygen was sucked clean out of the room and replaced with this cold feeling. Like death was there. I picked up the phone and called my girlfriend, who I practically begged to let me come over. She gave in and we ended up watching a movie then went to bed. Her phone rings about 2.30 in the morning and it's my roommate, who says I have to go to the house. I went, to find him standing over a dead body, who I found out was someone we worked with who had quit a couple days before. I guess what had happened is they went back to the house, both drunk and the other guy was being loud, so my roommate wanted him out. He wouldn't leave and they scuffled until roommate basically strangled him to death. The courts ruled it was manslaughter because of the toxicology reports on both of them. However, I know that isn't the case. This year has been a big one for me. Since January, I had a strong feeling one. If not both of my parents would die this year, and that this year was would one of great change. I found myself, often in the shower for whatever reason, practicing eulogies for both of them. I brought it up to my dad and he convinced me to think less on it. In March, my mom started acting very aloof, almost lost at points would spend hours in the bathroom. Turns out, she had stage 4 brain cancer, which we found out about in April. She slowly slipped away throughout the summer and finally passed away in August. Two weeks later my dad's brother had massive strokes and died as well. In the midst of this, my dad was also working hard to sell his 20 years old company, which he managed to do before mom passes. On his first day of retirement, he started having heart attacks, got a stent that failed a couple weeks later and sent him in to get a double bypass surgery, which had he made it out of, a week before my mom's service, my girlfriend, my partner for 4 years who I would spend my life with, dumped me because the pressure between us had gotten too much, now it's just me and my dog living across the country from everyone I know, dad is talking about traveling the world, there's a strong chance I am going with him now, it's been a freaking trip. I believe my sister and I had a connection beyond intuition. We weren't twins, or even biologically related, she was a foster child, for that matter, but we always just kind of knew when the other was in trouble. When I was 17 yo I was in a really bad car accident, 
I was having friends over that night and everyone had started showing up at my house but I hadn't returned home yet. My sister wanted my mom to call the hospital, but my mom wanted to respect my privacy and assured her I would be home in a little bit. My sister started freaking out and began grilling all of our friends about whether or not they had seen me. No one had heard from me. Finally, she gets my mom to call the hospital and find out if I had been admitted. I had been. Almost a decade later, I started getting nervous knots in my stomach. It lasted for a couple days and I felt like something was wrong but I didn't think too much about it. After I got back from Afghanistan I regularly got false bad feelings and was in the process of learning to ignore them. I got a call from our brother and he told me that our sister had been found dead where she had been shot and killed by a drug addict two days prior. I was living in Eastern Europe at the time, and my friend and I decided to surprise another friend who had been feeling depressed for quite some time. She'd had a really bad breakup. We lived in a pretty big city, so we decided to take the tram to her place instead of the bus we usually took, because it was closer. The whole time we're waiting for this tram, I have the undeniable feeling that we just need to go home. Well, the tram we took wasn't one of the newer ones, but one of the really old, Cold War era trams. Run down, very ghetto looking, but hey, can't pick your trams. We hopped on in and got ready for a bit of a commute. Three guys in about their 20s get on the stop right after we got on, and sit about two rows behind us. They're talking in Russian, which I don't speak or understand. My friend does, and she's getting more and more nervous by the minute. I'm blissfully unaware, but she starts asking me what the name of the stop was we needed to get off at, and I'm looking at the red out and trying to remember. I get the feeling that something's not right here, and we really shouldn't have made this trip. When I see the stop, we both get up. The guys behind us also get up. Something tells me this is not going to go down well. I was in front. My friend was behind, so I didn't see what happened next. I got off the tram, down the pretty steep flight of stairs. The guys followed us, grabbed my friend by the waist, and pushed her down the stairs. The next thing I know, she's yelling at me to run back on the tram, and so we bolt from one end to the other and make it back on just before the door slam on the creeps trying to assault us. Needless to say, we were pretty shook up, especially my friend. We made it back to the center of town and called a cab to take us home. Later, my friend told me that it was really lucky that we got off when we did, because she knew that they were waiting for us to get to the end of the line so they could grab us. Fortunately, none of us were hurt and my friend didn't get groped or anything, but it was a very, very close call. When I was about 13 or 14, my parents invited a new family that had just joined our church over for dinner. The mother had 5 children from 4 different men, and had brought her most recent live-in boyfriend to the dinner. I began trying to entertain her youngest child, aged 3, when I noticed that her behavior was off. She wasn't smiling, she would put her hands over her face randomly, and would jump at noises. I observed her the whole evening and something felt very wrong. After they left, I told my dad that I think she may be being abused at home. He immediately brushed me off. Something he did does frequently, because how could I, a teenager, suggest such a thing? Preposterous. Well, a few months later, the mother shows up at our house with her younger children crying and all out of sorts. Turns out her live-in boyfriend had been beating the 3 year old regularly. I was furious to know that this went on undetected months longer than it needed to. This experience taught me to always trust my gut, regardless of if I'm scoffed at. Children can be very intuitive and it's important that we listen. Hunters of Reddit, what did you see out there that made you not want to go back into the woods? At my property we built an outhouse that I regularly crap in when camping, hunting, etc. And have no qualms crapping in under normal circumstances. Now, on Memorial Day my friends, family and I all camp out at the property for the weekend and on the second to last day have a huge bonfire. Talking like 40 plus foot flames, in the main field, drink some beers, sing some songs and pretty much just have a good time. One such bonfire I scurried off down the one stroke two mile trail back to camp where the outhouse is to do my business. Mid ump I hear frantic scurrying and a hissing noise underneath me. I stand right the frick up spin around and come face to face with a raccoon in the bottom of the shitter that I had presumably just shat on. 
I noped out of there, pulled up my pants and then all out booked it back to the fire to recount the turn of events I had just endured. I grew up on the New Mexico reservation, I'm white my stepfather is Navajo, anyway, it's really rocky desert, mountain like area, like the Grand Canyon but smaller no white people go out there, the Navajos back then really hated white people, you can walk all day and never see anyone, I was on my horse hunting and came to this circle like depression in the sandstone and sand like someone made it a long time ago, there was no sound from animals around it no lizards on the rocks no bugs, it was scaring the crap out of my horse. He was screaming jumping kicking and I couldn't get him to calm down. So I got him away from there and tied him up to a pinion tree in sight. I went to check it out with a weapon of course. It was just a big circle about a foot deep and it looked like something was built there but very very long ago. I came back with friends and their horses and dogs. The horses did the same thing and the dogs just stayed on top of the hill whining. No one had any idea what it was but when we told our parents we were told to stay away from it. The only thing I could find out was that the Navajos and other Indians would put people and children who could not contribute to the tribe in a pit like circle to die from the elements. A long time ago if you were crippled or mentally challenged and couldn't hunt or farm no one was going to support you or take care of you. In the 70s and 80s growing up I had hours of chores every day even though I was going to school too. Exploring out there was amazing. I've seen things that no one would believe. My stepfather is Navajo. Don't know what the frick is going on out on the res but the Navajo people always have the best stories in these threads. Way wire air up in backcountry northern Canada when we came across into a clearing and little girl's purple backpack with little girl's clothes strew all over the place. Just thinking about it makes my blood run cold. I used to hunt with my grandfather when I was in middle school. I shot a doe, female deer, and then I had to watch a fawn run over. I didn't see it before, and start yelling and what looked like mourning. Kept trying to wake up its mother. One of the saddest experiences of my life. Will never hunt again. So a few years ago I went camping with my dad about a quarter mile off the trail. As we were cooking food a baby bear wander into the small clearing. We were a bit freaked out but it was probably more scared of us so it wandered away. Important later. We left a campsite to hike a bit and when it started to get dark we traveled back to our campsite. We realized we hadn't marked it in any way and spent a while looking for it. We heard some growling. Like really loud and we freaked. We started to walk on the trail back to the car with my dad holding our only flashlight. We hear a growl closer this time. Not super close but close enough we started to run. By then it was pitch black other than the flashlight. As I ran I heard my dad drop the flashlight. He found it but only one of the batteries was still in it. I was thinking this definitely felt like a basic horror plot. We ran pretty fast a few miles back to the car and drove home. We came back the next day and searched all day. Couldn't find it. We came back the next weekend still couldn't find it. The next weekend my dad went by himself and found it. He brought the stuff home. The tent had claw marks through it and all the food that we hadn't yet hung in a tree was eaten. Not super scary but I haven't gone camping since. My girlfriend and I were backpacking through Yellowstone and this was our first time in grizzly country. We don't mind black bears but grizzlies are something else. Anyway after a long day of hiking we set up camp for the second night. We washed up, had dinner, hung our scented items and food and got in bed. Deep in my REM sleep my girlfriend shook me awake, terrified because she heard growling. She was convinced there was a bear in our campsite. I immediately woke up with adrenaline pumping and full out fight or flight mode and grabbed the bear spray. As we sit there for a minute in complete silence, we hear the growling again. It was my stomach. To be fair, it was one of the more intense stomach growls I've had. I was walking through a field into a tree line. I was about 50 yards out when I heard some terrifying raptor like scream direct towards me. I froze and just stood there for about 20 minutes before chambering a shell and sitting down with my back against a huge tree. Didn't hear anything else. When I was 15 I was hunting in the Colorado Rockies for elk. We were about 12-15 miles up a mountain no cell service and thin. I had been up there two times before this incident took place. I was out with my uncle when we heard a woman scream curious and a little frightened we decided to head to check it out. 
We were hiking over a ridge for about 10 minutes when we saw bloody clothing a t-shirt and shorts nothing else. No footprints or anything to indicate where the scream had gone. We hightailed it back to camp and began to pack up it being our last two days. We packed out the next day and went to the ranger service gave them the location of the scene and that was it they asked a few questions and said they would follow up with us. We never heard anything. I was expecting it to turn out to be a mountain lion, not an actual woman leaving bloody clothing behind. Not me, but my father. He was in his early 30s deer hunting in western mass, 1980s. He was a few miles out from the main road when he came across a frozen human corpse. Immediately hiked out and called the authorities. Apparently a few miles away there was a camp for the mentally challenged. A woman had run off and got lost. My dad never did go hunting again after that. Was camping on a reservation and walked up to the lake from the campground. It was a 20 minute walk to the lake. To the left there was a destroyed and decaying elevated wooden path through a dead swamp and to the right the pipe from the water station at the lake. When we got to the lake all the animal noises had stopped. The lake was tannin stained and pitch black. The trees were all burned or dead and the dock was floating not attached to anything. We went on the dock and while I stayed on the dock, the other two went and took the crappy one or rowboat out into the water. Whole time absolute silence and my gut screaming danger. It took them a while to paddle back to the dock but they were freaking out too. So we hightailed it out of there and once we were halfway back we left the silence and immediately heard birds. I took a few steps back and it was basically silence. Few steps forward and birds. Not exactly an encounter, but creepy nonetheless. There are big foot sightings and reports around the time I was there though, so who knows. I went quail hunter about 10 years ago with my stepdad and his friend. It was kind of in the middle of nowhere next to the Colorado River on the California side. We thought we were alone and one night we hear this girl screaming in the distance. It startled us. So we grabbed our shotguns and walked toward this screaming. We roll up on this camp about a quarter of a mile away and it is this guy and we presumed his girlfriend. She is visibly distraught. He about crap his pants when three guys roll up with shotguns. He asked if everyone is okay and she just was looking at the ground and said she was fine and they were just having an argument. The next morning we wake up at like 4am to start the day's hunt and we walk past their camp to check on them again and they were gone. We never heard them leave. I hope that girl is okay. Me and my friend found this old, creepy, shed that looked like it was there for a million years. We naturally went inside and found a feeding trot with what looked like crap inside and a raccoon crucified on the wall. Raccoon Jesus died for our sins. I grew up in Alaska, just on the bubble of civilization. Sort of, up there even in the big cities you'll get bears and moose and such. I was walking home from the bus stop, our driveway was about a half mile long through woods. I heard noise to my right and stopped, hoping it was anything other than the one animal that scares me, and then it stepped out of the trees. I froze, my blood felt cold and stopped in my veins. A moose, full grown female, was standing maybe 20 feet from me in the middle of the road. It stopped, and turned to look at me. I was scared with no backup plan. What can a 12 or so year old do against a full grown moose? Then, it happened. I heard another noise behind me i truly thought i was dead i thought my life is now over i'm about to be between a mama and a baby moose and i'm going to die i remember feeling frozen and not at all tranquil and at peace i couldn't even scream from the edge of my eyesight i saw the second moose emerge from the thick stand of all the trees and disappear behind me i could hear the steps on the soft dirt my eyes locked onto the moose in front of me trying to will it to stay calm i stopped breathing and then felt it, a gentle whoosh of warm air down the back of my neck, followed by the unmistakable sound of a forced inhale. The moose behind me was sniffing my head. I could feel the breath, hear the nostrils flare. Some neighbor had dogs, off through the woods away, and they must have gotten out of their yard. They started barking inside the trees, and startled both moose that turned and ran back the way they came, crashing into the small trees and leaving. To this day, the only animal I'm afraid of is moose. I've been fishing with brown bears, had black bears say hi as they walked by my camp. Mountain lions stalk us and then leave, doesn't rattle me, until I see a cow moose alone, and then I just hope to whatever is higher than me, that I'm not between her and her cub. 
was not in the woods but prairie hunting pronghorn. In the middle of crawling up a hill to see if anything was at the bottom when a bullet passed over my head. It turned out some drunk thought my orange hat was a pair of horns. Well, there was an incident which taught me to regularly make what is called a J-turn. To watch check by back trail, I was scouting a distant group of hills along an inaccessible river, no docks for miles. There were past rumors of mountain lions being back in there, though all the eastern breeds are supposedly not existence anymore. There had been a light snow before dawn, but it didn't hinder me from walking way back and cresting the highest hilltop where I could see the big bend of the river. For whatever reason, I decide to circle the tippy top of this hill before going back down, where I could then pick up my old trail where I walked inwards. When I completed my circling, I came back down but immediately but stopped dead. There were a second set of prints right next to my steps, big paw prints. As I sat watching that river, there was a fking big cat sitting somewhere, watching me. Now, heading back down, I had lost the high ground, and the pursuit position was now in his favor. I made J-turns every 300 yards on the way back. I make J-turns on the way in, and out, of every area I hunt if it is in a remote location. And yes, I seen dogs, deer, and even men following my paths before. Not a hunter. But me and my friends were screwing around about a mile deep into the woods near my house and we found a pink suitcase with a name tag on it. We looked the name up and it was the name of a missing girl. Called the cops and handed it over but they never found her. They searched all of the woods and the area after that and still nothing came up other than her suitcase with some clothes and some toiletries. My grandfather was a fisherman with a bad habit of finding dead bodies. I haven't thought about this in a while but just googled it and found this description of one of his encounters on Saturday, the 11th of July, 1970. The Park County Sheriff's Office received a call from a fisherman near Gardner. He'd just pulled up the scariest snag of his life, a waterlogged human torso. By Monday, that mutilated torso was on a table in the Park County Sheriff's Office, being examined by the FBI. The head and arms had been cut off. The legs were gone below the knee. On the chest, amid stab wounds, there was a T-shaped cut where the killer had opened his body to get to his innards. Two things were clear, the victim was without a heart, and his murderer was heartless. Turns out it was cannibalism. Brother and I realized we were the ones being hunted once. Overwhelming sense of foreboding and beyond silence. No bird song or insects chirping, nothing was there except this presence, above and oddly behind us. The whole time we were out, light started to fade and we hadn't seen a thing, plus we're edgy as frick by now, so we turned in, stopping to glass a dam on the way back and check for animal sign. Lots of deer wallows and tree scratchings, crap loads of tracks in the mud by the dam. The owner asked us to find proof if he had feral pigs on the property or not. Anyway, cut it short, found the biggest feline footprints we have ever seen, about the size of my fist, less the claws surrounding the dam. We were in its kitchen and it was not happy. We were also in Australia where there are no big cats. I hunt and camp, and I'm not afraid of the woods. I still go solo backpacking. Back when I was in my early 20s I went camping hunting by myself in northern, GA near a town called Hiawasi. Camp was a mile or two down a sketchy dirt road. And I hiked up a mountain to a spot I liked to hunt another half mile or so. Anyway, it started to get dark and it started to snow and I didn't see any deer. So I gathered my gear and decided to head back to camp. When I got up and turned around I was about 15 yards away from the biggest black bear I've ever seen. We locked eyes and I froze. Easily a 500 pound or more bear. All I had was my 12 gauge slugger. Thankfully the bear turned and ran away. I slept in my car that night as I was alone out there, and for a while I was afraid of camping alone that deep in the woods. Not a hunter, but a wildlife biologist. I do a lot of work in Northern Cali and Oregon, and during the summer I work nights. I'm female and do most of the work solo. Last summer I was hiking in deep woods in Northern Cali, about an hour and a half from my truck with no cell service. Around 1.30 am I had finished up surveys and was heading back when I suddenly smelled something odd. I continued up the steep hill and as I came over the top I was suddenly on the edge of a large camp. The area was cleared and I could see several tents and UTVs, 
and trash everywhere. That weird smell? It was a porta potty. I could also see a fire pit with several figures sitting around it. I stopped dead. Immediately dropped to the ground and scrambled behind a tree. I was close enough to hear some mumbled conversation and occasional loud laughter. The only reason there would be a camp that far into the wilderness would be to grow weed illegally. These people can be very violent. And many people involved in the industry go missing every year. Women especially can be swept into flesh trafficking. Never to be seen again. I got out my spot device, GPS locator and satellite messaging and sent my location and situation to my supervisor. I crawled as quietly as possible back down the hill before retracing my steps to take a long way around. My adrenaline ran high until I got to the safety of my truck, and I crashed hard and cried on the phone to my supervisor. That was one of the more terrifying moments in my career. I've had several encounters alone with large predators, but nothing is scarier than encountering a group of strangers alone in the deep woods. A big butt black bear 10 yards away. Luckily he was just chillin looking for food. But I got out of there quicker than a flies to honey. Angler here. One night while at my favorite fishing spot my friend and I heard a noise. Now this sounded like some rustling about 10 feet or 3 meters away in some bushes. Now my friend called it off as just a rabbit. But I insisted on listening. Now that was no rabbit but instead steps. Well in the region I'm from we have quite a lot of coyotes. So we pass it off as a mangy curious beast catching a glimpse of our fire. So to progress the night and feel easy we began to make noise and toss sticks and rocks to the bush. After a lengthy sit by the fire and a few more pops we headed home leaving a few belongings behind. Well, when we returned the next day to retrieve our left belongings we noticed two sets of tracks. One large one small. These my friends belonged to cats. Oh yes one mighty big cat and her cub. The feeling I had in my stomach was not due to the beverages from the night before but the feeling of cheating death. I was out hunting and I christened my muzzin with its first deer so I was feeling good. Once the deer was dressed I threw it in the back of my truck because we butcher out at our farm. I sat down in my house and had a beer when I started hearing all these shrill voices outside. And I figured it was right near my truck so I tactically crapped my pants. Grabbed my nugget and went outside expecting battle. Only to find a bunch of 10 year old girls outside my truck looking in the bed. What? I find out that the neighbor's kids were having a slumber party and my mom for some reason called my neighbor and told them I had a deer in my truck so they all came to behold the spectacle I guess. Spent a week with a Shua family in the Amazon about 15 miles from Chone, Ecuador. Little background. Three of us gringo medical pre-medical students were staying with them on a medical education rotation, learning about traditional remedies. It was a blast. We stayed in a, in a separate shelter from the family, and the walls of our shelter was decorated with giant snake skins and tiger skins. Those beasts that had wandered too close to camp over the years. The jungle is a loud place to sleep. Millions of animals and insects clamor all night long and it blends into a sort of peaceful cacophony. After the gunshot rang out at 3am, the cacophony was gone. Absolute silence. It was the scariest sound I had ever heard. We clung to my 2 inches knife telling ourselves that it would protect us from whatever was coming. We cowered across from the entrance to our shelter awaiting what was to come. Certain a tiger was lurking, or that our lovely hosts had decided they were sick of us. We sat and shivered through the night. The silence was terrifying. When the sun rose and we finally felt confident enough to venture outside, it turned out an unlucky capybara wandered through camp during the night. Poor lil bugger got shot in the face at 3am and was the first meat we had eaten all week by 7am. It tasted like greasy venison. I'll never forget that night, or that lovely family. Three drunken deer hunters, from out of town. Shooting high power rifles into a thin stand of trees that has a park on the other side of it. I can't explain this, but we were hunting 25 years ago and we found a white tailed deer frozen into a river by his feet. Where it gets weird is this animal was cut in half. His rear end was missing but it was how clean the cut was. It had looked like it was done with a bandsaw. Also the animal had been gutted like it was cleaned out with an ice cream scoop. Completely cleaned. No blood trail no guts. Just a half a deer frozen and the ice eyes wide open. Missing its entire backside. 
I've got no explanation for this and I really don't even want to think about this anymore as we still can't fathom what happened. What is the scariest creepiest thing that has happened to you when you were home alone? It was raining pretty hard one night and I was about to go to bed. Our dog decided to start going nuts barking at the corner of the family room. We had just moved in so there wasn't anything in there but she just kept constantly barking at nothing. I tried to pull her away but she wasn't having any of it. She started showing her teeth and snarling, which she never does. I figured there must be an animal outside so I turned on the deck lights, deck is off the family room, and peer outside. Nope, nothing. I wasn't about to go outside because of the rain and I didn't see anything anyway. So I dragged the dog to the bedroom but she just won't shut up. Finally decide to get my shoes and umbrella on and walk around the house. Found one of my neighbors curled up along the side of the deck trying to protect himself from the rain. He's disabled and a little slow. He usually goes out for walks in the neighborhood. He got caught in the rain and couldn't find his house. If my dog hadn't gone nuts he might have been out there all night and who knows what could have happened. Totally not the ending I expected. So happy you decided to go out and check on the situation. I was home alone one night in middle school. I was in my room, which is right above our kitchen, watching TV. I had already shut all of the lights off downstairs cause I was eventually going to fall asleep and didn't want to get yelled at for leaving the lights on. So I am laying in my bed the family dog, a Chesapeake Bay Retriever, was lying next to me when I hear cabinet doors open and shut. It wasn't like they all opened at once and then shut but more like one after another for a few seconds. I freeze and look at the dog who at this point was an old lady, who perked up and looked at me. I peek out my window that overlooks our driveway and didn't see anything. Now I didn't think anyone was in the house because while the dog was lazy f she was a great guard dog and she would have responded if the door opened or whatever. So after a few seconds the dog gets up and starts moving towards the stairs and I decide to follow fully confident that if anyone was down there she would scare them. I grab my softball bat and my cell phone and follow her downstairs. As we come downstairs I notice the lights are on in the kitchen and I dial 9, 1, 1, because I know I shut the lights off prior to going upstairs. When we get in the kitchen all the cabinet doors were open which was obviously not how I left it. That's when I noticed that the door was still locked so I thought whatever did this was still in the house. So I quickly ran upstairs to my parents closet and called my parents and told them what's up. They came home and obviously didn't find anyone or any trace of anyone being in the house. We still do not know why the light was on and cabinet doors were open but we had some other paranormal like occurrence happen around that time so we chalked it up to the household ghost. Tell us more stories, please. One night when I was about 12 or 13, my parents were gone for a while and I was just staying up really late, past midnight on my desktop computer waiting for them to come home. Like most people, I had been told a million times not to talk to strangers on the internet but about half my friends list on MSN were people I had never met before so I was just chatting with a bunch of them. Out of nowhere, one of my online friends had told me exactly what I had been doing the past hour or two. Heck, what I was eating, drinking, playing with, when I had gotten up last. Things I hadn't mentioned in chat. I instantly got a horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. My desktop was set up in front of a big window so as far as I knew, this person I had been talking to, that was supposed to live in a different country than me, had found my address and been watching me through the window. Turns out, he had somehow hacked into my webcam. I always left it plugged in even though I had been warned not to when I wasn't using it, and had been frequently watching me through it whenever he wanted. It's been 10 years and I still have all the cameras on my devices covered in thick duct tape. I ended up talking to some hackers on Ventrilo when I was 16, and stupidly accepted a file from one of them. I don't remember what he said the file was but anyway, I told them I'm going to shower and when I came back, my webcam light was on. I knew right away and felt very stupid, at least mine had a light. I was home alone when I was like 9 or 10, whichever you are in 5th grade. It was literally the second day my mother allowed me to just walk home from school, rather than stay at daycare. Phone rings. Voice on the other end asks for David. I tell them sorry, wrong number. As a weird but relevant aside, 
We got constant wrong numbers when I was a kid because our home phone line was one digit off from H&R Block, tax prep service, so I had developed a sort of standard cadence to wrong number calls. It almost always went, H&R Block, sorry, wrong number, oh, I'm sorry, that's okay, so I'm on the line, waiting for him to say oh, I'm sorry, instead, he starts yelling that he needs to speak to David. He knows David is there. I tell him I have two Uncle Davids, but neither are there. The guy starts cursing and ranting in what, in hindsight, was pretty clearly driven by M. So I'm already pretty spooked, having never really encountered a fully crazy person in my life. And then he starts describing my house. He starts telling me that it's white with brick pillars on the green porch, red doors, and with a white dog in the backyard. He concludes the call with I know you're lying and I'm gonna come get your butt. In the next 30 seconds, I rush to get a knife in the kitchen, call my mom, and look frantically out the front of my house. Then there is a banging kicking at the door. I screamed at a pitch I didn't realize I could, and I ran into the bathroom, only locking door, and stayed there until my mom got home. When I heard the garage door open and my mom call out for me, I started sobbing and ran out to her, knife in hand. When I got older, I found out from my mom that the Uncle David the guy was looking for was a pretty bad drug addict for years, and that's why I hardly ever saw him. He probably gave someone he owed money to a bad address number. Thanks Uncle David. My husband went out of town for his first work trip following the birth of our first child, so it was me, my infant daughter, and dog at home, and I am counting it as alone considering I was the only one awake, and verbal, in the house at the time. Full stop. I just put my daughter down for bed and was in the kitchen cleaning up when I suddenly heard our garage door open. Something that should not be possible with my husband, and second of two garage door openers, literally in another state. I raced to lock the door coming into the house from the garage and crouched next to it for at least 3 minutes. Phone out and dial to 911. Trying to listen for any sounds of intrusion before cracking the door open just enough to reach my arm through and close the garage again. I did not sleep super well that night. Though some of that can be blamed on the nightmare that was my baby's sleep schedule at the time. And had at least 3 more mysterious garage openings overnight in the following week. It turns out that when I'd paired a spare garage door open the day prior. One of our neighbors was arriving home and just so happened to use their opener at the exact moment I pressed the link button in our garage. It took me an absurd amount of time to make the connection because they honestly don't go in and out of their house very frequently. In any case, that first instance had me acting out parts of a home intrusion scene in a horror movie. Two years ago, I get home from my last lecture from university, before the start of Christmas break. My family had gone to Scotland for the weekend. I was all alone at home for the weekend. Once I arrived at home, I showered and was getting food ready. After eating, I turned on my PS4, plugged my headset and began playing. However, an hour later, I hear loud thudding from upstairs floor. Rather than being brave and checking upstairs, I ran to close and lock the living room doors to prevent a robber from entering. I hurried to my phone and called the police, who arrived quickly and began searching. After 20 minutes of searching, they found that someone had broken into my house, through my bedroom window. Luckily, no valuables had been taken. I did, however get a 2 hour lecture from my parents on what precautions to take when home alone. Thank goodness you didn't go check it out. A few years ago, I, 24F, got home from work around 10pm while I was living with my parents, and they happened to be away on vacation that week. After cooking myself a late dinner I went onto the back deck adjacent to the kitchen to grab something I had left out there earlier in the day. A bizarre sound caught my attention, like a dog panting. So of course I searched to see where it was coming from. I looked up to see my neighbor, 40SM, across the street, standing on his deck buck naked and jerking off. He had been watching me through the window and did not stop when I discovered him. I was home alone after a dinner with my girlfriend. Around 3am I hear a very loud bang. My dog and I get out of bed to scope it out, hoping to find the reason for the noise. We searched for 15-20 minutes and could not find anything. We go back to bed, and not 10 minutes later, bang, this time I am shaking, 
It sounded like it was coming from the same spot. I spent the rest of night awake, not wanting to move. Found out the next day. Girlfriend put two sparkling waters in the freezer to cool them down. Forgot about them. Left the house and never told me about them. They exploded. That kept me up all night. That's terrifying and hilarious. Lived in a condo. In the middle of the night, I woke up to hear someone rattling my front doorknob. No one had keys to my condo except me. Then, the door opened up and I heard someone walking in. I was 100% sure I was being robbed. Fight or flight kicked in and I flew out of bed and ran toward the front door screaming get out of here which came out as complete gibberish as I had been sound asleep about 30 seconds prior and now had crazy adrenaline pumping through my veins. I was literally jumping around in my underwear screaming and waving my arms when it dawned on me that the two guys standing at my front door looked more scared than I have ever seen anyone. One of the guys held out some keys, his hands were visibly shaking, and said something to the effect of his friend had given him the keys to his place and said he could stay there while he was out of town. Turns out the friend lived directly above me and these guys went to the wrong floor. The floors were not numbered and neither were the condo units. By mistake, they didn't know they were at the wrong door and that the keys were the same. I was able to get into his unit with my keys and they could open up my door with their keys. Needless to say, I was standing outside the hardware store the next day waiting for them to open so I could buy a new lock for my door. But can't wait to find their scariest encounter story. The very first time I was home alone. I'm watching TV and there's a huge crash bang noise behind me in the kitchen. I didn't look or think. I bolted out the front door and sat on the steps outside, crying, until my folks returned like 10 minutes later. Turns out my mom's bread machine had been kneading the dough and vibrated itself off the counter. Really the most amazing thing is that the machine wasn't damaged. I have that same bread machine today and it makes delicious fresh bread. I love this one. This one didn't make me feel weird after reading the end of it. LOL. Lived in a second floor apartment my junior year of college and to save money I opened my balcony doors and windows and kept my AC off. This particular week my 75 pound dog W a terrifying bark was staying with my boyfriend and I forgot to lock my door. Terrible coincidence. Anyways I woke up in the middle of the night naked in my bed to a man standing in my bedroom. Had no clue what to do. Couldn't jump up BC naked so instinctively just said yo WTF. His response was I came up to shut your doors and windows at which point I noticed all were shut. Then he left and I locked my door cried. One of the first nights I was home alone with my brother. I was probably 13 or so. Parents went to a concert and left me in charge of my little brother. Just after he goes to bed there's a banging at the door. I'm terrified. I stay quiet and sneak to the window. It was a neighbor from up the road. We weren't friends. He's never been in my house before. I'm wondering why the frick he wants to come in now. I stood on the other side of the door and said, my parents aren't home. I can't open the door stupid. I know. Never let strangers know there are no adults around. He yells back. It's getting dark and I just wanted to let you know that your garage door is wide open. I felt like a schmuck, but I'm still alive. Not a schmuck. Probably best possible thing to do. Aside from closing it in the first place. You never know what someone's intentions are. I was home alone with my toddler, getting ready for bed after putting her down for the night when I heard her call for me. So I went to her room and she was fast asleep. Weird, maybe she had woken up for a moment and then passed out again. Got to then end of the hall before I heard her call for me in a panic. Rushed back in and she was still asleep in the same position. Sat with her for a few minutes and then made my way to bed when I heard my husband call my name. Must have come home from work early, so I go to him but he's not there. Call him and confirm he's still at work and decide I must have here a neighbor or something. Crawl into bed and hear my husband call for me again and then continue talking as if he's having a conversation with someone. Then hear my child calling me again and rush into her room. Still asleep. This goes on for a while until I decide I must really need some sleep and go back to bed with the lights on. Too freaked out to sleep. I was staring at a picture hanging on the wall when it disappeared. Like the wall just ate it. Look at another wall hanging and the same thing happens. They would reappear when I looked away and then be eaten by the wall again when I looked directly at them. Decide I'm officially an insane person and call husband to come home. 
fall asleep eventually and wake up and everything is normal except my heart rate can't decide on a pace, swinging up and down between 30s 180s. Head into the hospital and I'm having a hypertensive crisis. Turns out it was the beta blockers I'd started recently. Nobody had heard of that reaction so they kept me for a couple days until my numbers stabilized. No hallucinations after the first night other than hearing dogs bark randomly for a couple days. Not good times. Yay beta blockers can really mess with you. My wife was on them a long time ago but it basically knocked her emotions. Both good and bad. Completely out and she didn't feel anything it really scared us house sitting baby sitting for a new neighbor she was a single mom from the east coast moved to indianapolis i was a sixth grader all i had to do was sit in the house and do my math homework while she was on a date a two-year-old baby was sleeping in his crib room around 9 p.m i get a call and answer it's a man who only asks who are you i say i'm the babysitter then he starts asking all these questions about where the mom is and who I am personally. I get scared and hang up and call the mom and let her know. The guy calls back and then just starts saying the address I'm at. Then asks if the baby is okay. When I say yes he says how can you be so sure when he's that close to a window to which I just go I am just the babiator and in trying really hard on my math homework and now I am scared and I am also failing math. Basically a mental breakdown. Happened. Five minutes later the mom shows up and explains it's her ex-husband who found her. She hands me a wad of cash and excuses me. IDK if the guy was in the bushes or calling from Massachusetts or what. It was scary. I am just the babiator and in trying really hard on my math homework and now I am scared and I am also failing math. I'm so sorry to laugh at something that scared you so much but this part had me in freaking hysterics. <laughs> Not me, but my cousin. He was living in an apartment in a shady part of Madison. W.I. and some jerk off was trying doors in his building. Was laying on the couch watching a movie. Facing away from the door. When his front door opened. From the light in the hall he could make out a silhouette reflected in his TV. But he wasn't expecting anyone. He told me he was scared shitless. And just said. Loud and firm. Without turning around. Get the frick out of here. Now. Whoever it was did exactly that. I don't know what I would have done in that same situation. This is why we lock doors. People. So was out of town on business. So I treated myself and ordered in from my favorite restaurant. A delivery guy arrived. And insisted he had to come into my place to deliver the food and take payment. I had to loudly refuse this multiple times. In the hopes a neighbor would hear me. And he kept insisting. To finally got him to process my payment in the hallway. But he was muttering under his breath the whole time. Scared the heck out of me. I double locked the door when he left and sat up all night feeling uneasy. Wish I had reported him to the restaurant. But I was too shaken to think about it. Yeah someone who has delivered food for years from multiple different restaurants that was by no means normal or procedure. Everywhere I've worked has specifically said do not go in the house even when invited in. If it's raining or something and you do go inside don't go past the doorway. That dude was up to some shady crap. Rented a cheap B-level duplex in a bad neighborhood for 3.5 years so that I could save up money to buy a house. First thing I did after unpacking from moving in was bolster security. I changed the deadbolt on the front door and installed a locking doorknob in place of the crusty non-locking one that was there. All the windows were old, crappy aluminum slider style windows with horrible locks and the back door was a patio door going straight onto a deck. So I bought a hardwood 1x4 and 2x4 and cut pieces to put in the window and door tracks so that any potential intruder would have to break a window rather than simply opening one to gain entry. I'm convinced that a past tenant was a drug dealer. In the first 6 months I had 4 separate instances of tweakers knocking on the door looking for Sam. A couple of the tweakers forlornly stepped off when I told them that nobody named Sam lived there. Two others got worked up, asked where Sam had gone and where he was living. To which I responded that I had rented the place and had no idea who Sam is. After being visited by the tweakers I redoubled my efforts to ensure that all doors were locked at all times. I still forgot to lock the front door once in a while and I had a very creepy experience one night after forgetting to lock it. I was in the middle of cooking dinner one dark evening, 
and went to the washroom. After washing my hands and exiting the washroom I came back to my kitchen to see a middle aged Asian man dressed tall in black coming up the stairs from the entrance into my kitchen. Who the heck are you I asked, startling him. He said he was there to fix a toilet. I was sure I was going to die, but figured I ought to talk to the guy for a few seconds before lunging for a kitchen knife and fighting for my life. The guy explained that the landlord, Gary, had sent him to fix a toilet. I told him that Gary wasn't my landlord and my toilet was working fine. He asked what address he was at, I gave him my address, and he started profusely apologizing, saying he had the wrong address. He backed down the stairs cautiously, put his boots on, and sheepishly left the duplex. I'm still not sure if he was looking for Sam to square up some unpaid drug debts and left when he realized that Sam wasn't there. If he was looking for a woman to prey on, found me instead, and reconsidered his insidious plan. Or if he really was just some poor sap who walked into a stranger's house while on a mission to fix a toilet for Gary. But I never mistakenly left the door at that place unlocked again. On first read taking his boots off sounds like he was not looking to do any harm. Second read I paint the all black clothes as sinister and he removed the boots to be quieter. I wasn't at home. I was working the night shift at a nursing home. I'm an RN. Now disabled. It was just me and a CNA and we were the only staff in the Alzheimer's unit. She had the TV on some stupid show about hauntings in America. She looks at me and says, you'd think nursing homes would be haunted a lot. Because so many people die here. I just gave her a look and told her to shut up. This place is creepy enough at night. We go to do rounds on a resident who was in the process of passing. She was on hospice and her family was aware. I checked on her every 15 minutes because I didn't want her to be in pain and to see if she was in distress. At this time, she wasn't in distress but it was obvious she wasn't going to last much longer. Her family lived across the country and had requested not to be called past 9pm. So, I stayed with her and held her hand and read to her from the Bible as she was a devout Catholic. After all of the aftercare was finished, the CNA and I had been in the room for 15 minutes. I left to call the funeral home and all of that. I'd barely dialed the phone number when the CNA came running down the hallway and said, She's breathing again. I don't know what to do she was obviously freaked and her face was pale. I went to the resident's room and she was definitely breathing. I checked vital signs and though everything was much lower than normal levels, they were there. I checked them several times after she'd passed and there had been no blood pressure, no pulse, no anything. She lived for another 5 years and claimed she'd met God. This is the creepiest thing that has ever happened to me. May have freaked you out, but I think it meant everything to her. I was nursing my newborn in the house we had newly built and just moved into. We didn't have a fence yet, and the back of the house was basically all huge picture windows. I am in the bedroom, topless, when I see a guy come right up to the glass door in the room and peer in. I screamed and jumped up away. He didn't try to get in or anything. I'm not even 100% sure he saw me. He was an older guy. When I told my husband about it, he said it was probably an older contractor from the area who liked to come and walk the new neighborhood to check out the construction and new houses. I know he was innocent, but it scared me to death at the time. Serious, people who spend days, weeks or months at sea. What is the creepiest or most unsettling thing you've seen or that has happened out there? Losing the horizon on a calm star filled night. It gets super dark and the light from the moon and stars is reflected from the surface of the water. It's like you're sailing across a universe. That sounds more amazing than creepy. I would love to experience that. Two things. Both off of the east coast of Tasmania on a fishing trawler but on different occasions. One. One of the deckhand slipped and a fish pick went straight through his eye. I was on deck and remember it happening in very slow motion. It took over 12 hours for a chopper to come and lift him to hospital. I'll never forget the screaming. 2. One night on deck after pulling up the net, everyone could hear a man yelling. We couldn't quite hear exactly what they were saying but they were obviously distressed. The strange thing was that we were on deck before sunset and didn't see anyone or anything else around. We called out and searched for hours. We saw and found nothing. There were no reports of missing fishermen, ships, distress signals, etc. Scared the crap out of everyone and was a very quiet trip for the rest of the week. Sailing on a tall ship off the south coast of Ireland. 
A heavy fog rolled in. There was still light from the sun to see by, but it was just white in every direction I looked. I climbed up to the top of the main mast, and looking down, I could see a perfect circle of water just encircling the ship, then nothing. It felt like we were floating in a simulation, and was simultaneously one of the coolest and eeriest things I've experienced. We were anchored out on France and I was out on the sponson. Did I spell that right? Smoking. I watched a little red light creep along underwater next to the ship for a good 10 minutes. It was smooth and slow moving. Scared me. But I kept thinking I'm on a navy ship. I can see all the lights. The absolute feeling of aloneness. Not loneliness. Different in the middle of the night. No moon or stars. Just the darkness. The hum of the ship and the sound of your own breathing. If you stare off into the darkens too long you can kinda feel it pulling you. Almost hypnotic. Sounds cheesy but so freaking true. I always kept my back to the wall just to ground myself. Three things stand out in my memory. 1. Being deep out at sea during a massive storm and being in the trough between waves. Seeing the swell just rising on either side of the ship like massive walls is very intimidating. 2. Again, during a storm but seeing lightning hit the ocean nearby. It just lights up and foams then you see dead fish float to the top. But the way the ocean lights up is pretty surreal. 3. A nice one. Had a pod of dolphins follow us for about a week. Every day we would watch them playing in our wake. It's pretty awesome. It was about 11.30pm. We were about 200 miles away from the nearest point of land. Saw a white flare go off. I let the officer of the watch know and gave him rough bearings. Flare was no more than 10 miles away. The officer got the captain. Captain told us to head in that direction. There was nothing in that direction according to the radar but better safe than sorry. Captain wasn't too worried as it wasn't a distress flare. Followed that path for half an hour but came across nothing so went back to our normal course. Right before the watches swapped at 0 hundred hours and right before we turned back on course, heard some whistling on VHF channel 16. Normally the distress frequency, but still nothing on our radars. The captain still wasn't concerned so we left it at that. I made a log of the events and our coordinates just in case something did happen and someone was actually lost at sea but nothing was ever reported by the coast god or any other vessel. I was backpacking through Panama and sailed down to Colombia on a sailboat. A day or so past the San Blas Islands we were in open ocean. Everywhere you looked was ocean until the horizon. One night we got stuck in a bad storm and lightning was right over top of us and I was asleep in the bunk when lightning stuck very close to us and woke me up and scared me half to death. I went out on the deck to try and calm down as it was around 3am. I found the captain out on deck looking off towards the horizon. He was staring at this black shape that we could only see when lightning struck in the distant. He said it was probably a small island but there were no islands in the area. I watched it really closely and noticed it was moving and fast. The shape was pitch black and I soon came to the conclusion it was a boat and not a regular boat it was a drug running boat. They kept all of their running light and navigation lights off to remain hidden from prying eyes. Needless to say that was a bit unnerving as the area is known for drug smuggling and pirates. The captain ended up grabbing the spear gun and said just make sure they keep heading north and not towards us. 1. There's this time on sea called TPOD. Total period of darkness. It's nothing much, but there is no moon during this time. Moreover as there is absolutely no source of light in the open sea, so TPOD can get a little weird. You would see absolutely nothing. It's just your ship sailing into nothingness, while the waves splatter your bows. 2. Saw pirates once in Indian Ocean. Now, when you see a vessel on the edge of the horizon, there's no telling how long it will take for you two to come across. But this small pirate boat took, I think a minute or so to cross our bows. They had a couple of AK-47s and had covered their faces. And yes, they had a very fast boat. Dang that is scary. Did they mess with your ship or just carry on? I work on Lake Michigan now and I can hear someone crying out in the middle of lake at 2am when it's calm sometimes. I'm also on a 100 plus year old barge that used to be a ship so it's probably haunted. I was working on a car carrier 4 years ago in the Middle East. Our typical route went through pirate waters at times, and so we always picked up 4 ex-marines as security in a car bar. Jordan before we went, 
One night while we were going through pirate waters off of Yemen we started to have problems with the main engine. So we stopped and had to drift for a bit to figure out what the problem was. During this time I was working on the stern, back end of the vessel. I couldn't really see anything out in the ocean. Everything was dimly lit on the ship. I don't know why, but I got bored and turned on the spotlight and there he was. This guy with a gun in a rusted little boat staring at me about 15 feet from the ship. I just stared back at him, kind of stunned. I was afraid if I reached for the radio to call one of the marines he'd shoot me. The marines had weapons. So he looked at me and I looked at him and he sort of gave me a nod as if he was telling me well played and I gave him one back. Then he slowly rode his boat back off into the deep pitch black night. I didn't know how many others there were. But I did call it in on the radio as soon as I lost sight of him. I still remember his face today, the deep stern concentrated look. Jesus that would scare the crap out of me. Thanks for finding the post. During watch, I saw what must have been 300 dolphins in pods of 5-10 all leaping as they passed us. I saw the dilapidated boat of Haitian refugees. About 50 of them were children. We sailed close enough for me to see their faces and the sight seared into my mind. Most unsettling experience was a man overboard drill we conducted in the evening. We dropped Oscar over the side with his PFD and emergency light. After turning the ship around, the sun was all but gone. I tried to keep an eye on the PFD light the entire time. As Oscar drifted between the waves, it put into perspective of how important it is to keep an eye on someone who's fallen overboard. Even a blink and you'll lose where it is. How small you are compared to such vast ocean of nothing. Probably when the ship goes completely silent from a power failure. No vibrations. No sound of air coming through the duct. And no lights except for battle lanterns. This happens between the loss of main power and the start of emergency power. Or when the main seawater pump was losing suction. It was fluctuating the frequency of the generators causing the lights to go bright and dim in quick succession until the generator tripped due to overspeed. Saw pirates off the African coast by Djibouti. I got a couple more stories from my time out there. More stories. In port in Estonia during the summer. Sat on top of the stack and watched as the sun dipped just under the horizon just to come right back up. In some parts of the ocean. The propeller would agitate by a luminescent algae causing a light show to appear underwater in the wake. I had a real freak out one morning after I got off the night watch. Right after I fell asleep, the navy side decided to do a live fire exercise. The 25mm cannon was right above my stateroom. As others have already said, the aloneness in the TPOD is an experience all in itself. Nothing but blackness. Stars abundant in the sky, but not enough to see the horizon. If you're lucky, the only sounds you hear are the vibrations of the ship. The rest of the noise you hear is from your mind trying to comprehend the silence and darkness. As I go through these stories in my head, probably the creepiest thing that has ever happened was being told of a shipmate who lost it. He started stabbing dirty laundry bags saying that the ghosts were out to get him. When his roommates got the knife from him, he reached into his rack and grabbed another, and then another, and then another. All in all, guy had like 20 knives and a pair of safety scissors. Edit 2. Electric Boogaloo. Unsettling, we got a report of a lifeboat that got loose from a ship in a bad storm. We were tasked in finding it to put a marker on it. We didn't have the means of recovering it. Seeing a half-sunken lifeboat adrift in open waters gave me some serious chills. Unsettling, we got a report of an abandoned sailboat. We believe it was from the same storm. Tasked with marking it and to recover the inflatable life raft the Spanish Coast Guard used to rescue those on board. Creepy, being told by a shipmate all the places she has fricked in the engine room. Funny, drunk guy on board took a crap in a bucket and left it in the paint locker. Chief mate was not amused. Often take my smallish fishing boat with just me or sometimes another person on board for a night or two. Marine mammals coming close to the bait on a dark night and breathing is pretty unsettling. Dead quiet and then a bloody great exhalation. Seeing whales in the sound are less than 20 feet under the boat is pretty strange and you just gotta hope they look before they surface and don't get wrapped up with the anchor. The worst however was waking up to find the anchor had let go and I was drifting on a moonless night complete disoriented and still not fully awake. Took a while to process what had happened and the realization process was not fun. My dad woke up at 3am out on the boat and decided to chuck a line in. 
A seal popped up out of the water mob, and scared the crap out of him haha. <laughs> guys, guys he is awake, watch this. My uncle was an engineer from the age of 16 when he was kicked out of the house until last year around 63. He's had ships sink that he was meant to be on, with his best friend drowning in the process. Somali pirates tried to get aboard one time, had Kalashnikovs and all, they dropped a fridge on their boat Lomeo. Worked on a cruise ship, we had an Oscar call, man overboard, the ship turned on a dime, almost sideways to turn around to get him. When the rescue boat tried to pull him out of the water he kept swimming away from them yelling don't take me back there, you can't take me back there, I won't go with you, I'm not going to die. He had stopped taking some meds apparently and thought all the employees on board were in a cult and wanted to kill him. Accidentally swam above the nesting site of this big butt trigger fish. Thing got angry and kept attacking me. Dive buddy managed to find a submerged metal rod. He used that to fend off the aggressive fish just like a Spartan doing last stand. Swimming in Cuba with my dad, just on the beach kinda bit and was getting tired so I put my feet on this rock. Some blackfish with weird teeth bit my small toe and I thought I caught it on a rock. But the sucker kept trying to bite me until I swam like 10 meters away from him. It was weird that this fish, smaller than my palm was squaring up to me from standing on his rock. When you're hundreds of miles from the nearest human and you see a mountain dew can float by or a whale entanglement, it's pretty upsetting. Or sitting dark and ship in complete darkness looking at the stars you've ever seen and realizing how tiny you really are. Honestly, the deja vu. There was an entire day where I became physically ill because I couldn't shake the feeling that this day was exactly like the one before it. The sound of a propeller spooling up, the smell of exhaust. Someone patting me on my back, the steps I took and the thoughts I had thought. It was so strange of a feeling that I still have no idea what actually happened. You died the first time. In the South China Sea, there tends to be a lot of small fishermen boats trying to catch deep sea fish. Our aircraft carrier annihilated one. This happened in the middle of the day so you could see the debris. I heard mixed stories about whether or not the fisherman was okay in the end. But a lot of people got him a fucked for that. Most unsettling thing I've ever seen was actually on a relatively short trip, relatively close inland. We were on this big old catamaran of all things, just headed out on a day trip in the fall. It was a quite cool fall day, raw, grey, and rainy on the coast of New England. Actually, very rainy, but the drink seemed calm enough from shore. So about 200 landlubbers who don't normally do any boating cram onto the boat. You've got about 3 levels inside, with a deck on the first, then another top side above, and this thing normally whips at about 30 knots. Anyways, we get out there a bit, and it gets rougher than it looked. The boat's getting tossed around some. I'm running around the deck and top side getting positively soaked by some of the heaviest rain I've been outside in. Then I go inside. It was like what I imagined the freaking plague was like in the 1300s. I mean... It looked like a scene out of some post-apocalypse movie where everyone got Ebola or something. It's just dozens and dozens of people, all close to each other, not enough buckets, all at various stages of puking or having just puked. Freaking vomit was everywhere. The stench was totally unbearable. People were just hawking up bile by near the end of it. The higher floors were no better. I went topside and dealt with the driving rain and getting tossed around just to avoid the plague. It was probably the second closest to hypothermia I've ever gotten. I was frozen to the bone getting off that freaking boat. And I didn't eat all day because the puke party was so gross. I'm lurking in this thread way after the fact. But I hope you know I am inconsolably cackling at the term hawking up bile to the point of tears. Thank you for the laugh. An intruder alert over the 1MC. 600 miles off the coast of Japan. We were all trying to figure out a... How stupid an intruder would have to be to board an aircraft carrier at C, 600 nm from the nearest land, and B, was I going to have to repel borders in this day and age? Where's my cutlass? Where are the carronades? Then, 7 minutes later, the announcement came, this is a drill, repeat, this is a drill. Dang, your eye would have the same thought process as you, anyone trying to board an aircraft carrier is either stupid or extremely dangerous. 
Mildly NSW. A story I heard from when I was in the navy, but a couple of years ago on a ship there was a male creeping around jerking off guys while they slept. Someone thought they were having a wet dream and woke up to the guy giving him a handy but the creep ran away before he was caught. They called him the rack. Slang for bed. Jack bandit and to this day his identity remains unknown. Here's a positive one. Someone else mentioned the total period of darkness. However if you are in an area with plenty of stars, this period is one of the most beautiful natural phenomena you can find. Combine this with totally still seas, and the reflection makes it appear like the boat is traveling through space. A transcendent experience. The best view of the stars I ever got was crossing the English Channel as a kid. I really want to see them from further out to sea but I've got more qualifications to get before that happens. Next best thing has been the stars from the mountains in Snowdonia. Such a beautiful place. Not exactly creepy but I had a panic attack when I was a rookie on a tall ship. I was alone in the room with radio, no officer nearby for a while and then I hear. Frederick Chopin. Frederick Chopin. Frederick Chopin. You are heading east. What is your intention? I imagined all sorts of military vessels about to shoot at us while I called for officer in panic. I feel like drinking and whoring would be my answer. Sure I would get in deep crap, but I think it would be worth it. It's not really creepy but I once woke up while sleeping on deck, got dressed and started getting my things together before I realized that it was only 3am. The full moon was extremely low and combined with the reflection off the water it looked like daylight. That was a normal thing for me with extreme lack of sleep. I would wake up to putting my boots on or working on my blanket. It was everyone too not just me. I would even do it for a while after I got home. I've seen more creepy stuff in port than at sea. For example, a man hung himself from his mast one Christmas. I was giving a briefing on deck and didn't notice until the police arrived to cut him down. I moved my guys below deck pretty quickly then, but was not comfortable with how long we'd had a corpse in our vista. I've also been followed along a quay by a master baiting fisherman. I didn't like that as there was nobody else on my boat and only the sea beyond it. Fortunately he was, like most flashers, totally non-confrontational so I could do a 180 back to the crew in the bar. It still shook me how unnerved and vulnerable I felt for those few minutes though. At sea, I suppose the creepiest thing was still fairly coastal. Doing an overnight crossing from the Balearics to the mainland, I was caught out by an unforecasted lightning storm. My crew were very inexperienced and hasn't even packed waterproofs. Also, the boat had a carbon fiber mast, which is great for weight and stability but can explode if hit by lightning. So it was a tough night anyway. Then I heard a mayday of a man overboard only 20m from us. It was a hard decision to carry on away from the boat in distress and towards the edge of the weather system. The good news is that they found him alive at dawn. It was still a wet, fraught, and guilt-ridden night listening to the search until then. Dead body. My ships was crossing the Atlantic for a med cruise and we found some dude floating that had been in the water for some time. We launched a boat to go retrieve the remains and parts of the dude came off while the crew was trying to get him into the boat. That was pretty gross. My ship was doing a transatlantic in the middle of winter. We kept receiving updated optimized routes because of the number of storms around us. Sea conditions got to the point where our CO told the crew that unless they were going on watch, non-essential work was suspended. While this was going on, our mast gained some cracks as well as some of our superstructure. We had piping on the wee third deck get partially ripped from the bulkhead. On a tall ship for the military, we had a guy fall from the rig and land in the water. It was in the middle of a storm in the Caribbean. When we brought him back onto the ship, we saw he'd broken his leg and hip. So he'd tread water for about 12 minutes without the use of his legs in 5-6 featuring swells. We made an emergency stop in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba and dropped him off to get treatment. He's been flown back to the States and he's recovering pretty well. I was running a fishing boat on a lake and we came across a boat that had just sank. First we found a sweater then a hat. We slowed down and, and found a debris field. We were the only boat in the area at the time. We then assisted in the search for the victims. Guys had Brennan missing for a day. Luckily a helicopter found them 10 miles away alive. It was super unsettling. Thank god they found Brennan. 
He is the main DPS in my DND group. Didn't know he did sailing though. So this is a story from my dad. He spent 14 years in the US Navy serving aboard nuclear fast attack submarines. This story is more unsettling that it is creepy. He and his boat were deployed into the North Sea and about a week into their voyage one of the senior enlisted crew members died of a heart attack. Well submarine have very tight operational security, which means once they go under the water they won't come up unless it's an emergency or they reach a US naval base. So when this guy died only a week into their operation they only had done choice. Put him in the freezer. So there was a dead member of their crew in the freezer for nearly 2 months. Oh and because they had to clear out room to fit him everyone on board was ordered to eat a triple serving of ice cream or it would go bad. Returning from deployment during desert storm, we were in the middle of the Atlantic, like seriously, middle of nowhere, deep ocean. Suddenly we had a contact on the radar. As we get closer, it's as seriously small, like 40 feet or so, sailboat with an old guy standing up waving his arms and hailing us. As we draw closer, it's a little old man, on this boat, in the middle of nowhere, with only his dog. We thought for sure he needed assistance but, nope, just wanted to know if we had any cigarettes we could give him. We ended up giving him some fresh water, extra food, a couple of ships hats and t-shirts, and he was on his way. So imagine that, thousands of miles from anything, dude just needed some smokes. A lot of suicide and a lot of ghost stories. Nothing's creepier than going down to the 8th deck on a tiny butt ladder at 2am when you're in a humid part of the world. The radios sometimes don't work down there and if you slip and fall who knows when you'll be found if you've got a crap watch team. Last year I was on the USS North Carolina, the old battleship from WW2. One of things I concluded, that even when I was a younger man, I probably would have knocked myself cold trying to run up and down those ladders and through the hatches in wartime. Because the ship is a museum, they have bumper pads at head height on most of the openings to protect the public. A buddy of mine who ships cargo in a huge frickin' ship had to fight some speedboat pirates off with a hose once. Pretty wild story, to be honest. The second I heard speedboat pirates I thought he was fricking with me but it turns out pirates jam out on speedboats these days. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.